All right, so this is something that um, popped up on my feed. Um, and when I clicked on it, I had no idea the story was about Pittsburgh. Uh, it, you know, it, it's it's an AP it was an AP article that talked about transphobia within uh, private cop Facebook groups. And I didn't expect it to be about Pittsburgh, but it ended up primarily being about Pittsburgh. It ended up being about the the city that I live in, right? And none of this is, I would say, shocking. It's more of just like revelatory. Like it, it's one of those things where you're like, "Yep, th cool." Now we have now we have proof to the pudding, right? Now now we have something that we can show whenever we're like, "Hey, the criminal justice system is racist," and and cops have racist ideologies and they don't care about minority groups and people go oh pish posh that's just a that's just an old wives tale that's 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 the, that's just a myth you know it's it's like the mighty minotaur it's 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 just some make-believe shit and now you can sit there and go boom they're talking about hateful shit in a facebook group so let's let's dissect the story about what this is so there's a facebook group called pittsburgh area police break room and the idea behind this room is to vent and rant and share ideas and decompress, right, for police officers specifically, retired or active. And there's plenty of active and retired police officers in this group. And like I said, it's pri it, the, the reason why this group was created was for primarily an innocuous reason, right? Like every everybody has that within their, their circle of friends or their circle of work-related uh, folks, right? Your... your uh, uh, peers, as it were. And it's somebody that you can go to and just be like, oh, man, can you believe this shit? Let me tell you about why I hate TPS reports, right? Like comics do this shit all the time. You know, we'll talk about uh, bookers or venue owners and we just vent to each other of like, can you believe this shit? Like, I can't believe this person did this. It really sucks that we have to go through X, Y, Z within our industry and, you know, you, you have friends that you can kind of confide in. And that's good. It's 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 supposed to be healthy and positive. Well, here's the problem with this is that the group primarily is bitching about things like Black Lives Matter protests and is referring to them as terrorists and is chastising police officers who kneeled for the protesters uh, last summer. Right. We, we all saw the propaganda videos of, oh, man. Look, uh, uh, you know, look at this cop. They're, they're they're kneeling with the protesters in solidarity. Isn't that beautiful? Uh, but what I'm assuming these people missed, because corporate media does not show this stuff, and I'm assuming that most of these people watch corporate media, primarily based on the way that they are talking within this Facebook group, is they missed that, you know, an hour later, in the same spot that the cops kneeled, they're shooting rubber bullets and tear gas. Uh, at the protesters, right? We saw that in Buffalo where the where this 80-year-old uh, anti-war protester was knocked back so hard that he hit his head off the concrete and suffered like uh, a concussion. His in the back of his head was bleeding and nobody came to help him. Yeah, the, a day before that video was taken, the Buffalo police officers were taking a kneel, uh, taking a knee as it were with, uh, with all the protesters, you know, and, and these cops fucking missed that. They must have missed that, and and they don't realize that it's propaganda. That really, the kneeling for police officers is in their favor. Like it makes them look better, and that's really all it was. It was a PR stunt. And I bet if they knew that, because if they if they paid an attention to anything other than corporate media narratives, they would probably be on board with that level of propaganda. It's kind of the irony of them complaining about this. Oh, they're kneeling with these protesters. Well, they're doing it. It's a PR stunt so that later when they are attacking them with rubber bullets and chemical weapons, you know, the media can throw a little fluff piece in there for them. So this is it's a so that's just an ignorant attack. It's just not <laughs> like they just don't know any better. Right. And then there's a plethora of racist comments, as per usual. Again, we kind of knew that this was going to happen. Right. And. The unfortunate thing is, is like Facebook didn't shut them down for any of this stuff because Facebook can't. Right. Because uh, as long as they are not directly calling for violence, it doesn't really go against First Amendment issues. It doesn't really go against any of uh, 
a, any of their community standards as, as so you know as it were but if you're a leftist channel that calls out warmongers or if you're a leftist channel that calls out propaganda or if you're a leftist channel that uh calls out the the uh this the nature of u.s imperialism then it's like hey you're towing the line and you might be you're you're fake news that's that's how fucking facebook operates ah uh, but if you're but if it's a deluge of fucking racism and transphobic and uh anti lgbtq uh rants uh daily on your fucking facebook group bah, don't worry about it it'll probably go nowhere it's just boys being boys it's locker room talk no big deal no big deal right now, within the article, it did say that Facebook shut this group down uh, a few days before this article was published, right? And and there's a there's a spokesperson from Facebook that's like, oh, man, we had no idea you guys were going to do a story. We just did it because it's the right thing to do, which is like, it's bullshit. Like, how many fucking private Facebook groups are there, which is just built for racist vitriol, just built for transphobic vitriol, just b built for homophobic vitriol? Like, there's probably thousands of them out there. And the crazy part is, and we know this from the Blue Leaks, the FBI and a bunch of law enforcement are aware of these groups. They're aware of this co sort of shit, but they just kind of let it happen because they don't care. Until it becomes a direct call for violence, they don't really give a shit. And even when it does become a direct call for violence, they're like, we'll see where this goes. <laughs> That's just how these fucking people operate. Now, once this was revealed, uh, most police departments declined interviews. And then they sent out like these these kind of you know, uh, boilerplate statements about, oh, man, we didn't know this sort of stuff was happening and, and we don't really condone or, or stand by uh, these sort of statements from our police officers. We we want them to be upheld uh, in a more professional manner. And even when they're, uh, you know, uh, w when they have a, a presence online, we want them to act in a in a manner that would be uh, professional and and make the police departments look good you know we we want them to uh to 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 uh, what, what is it let me let me let me see if i can find the exact um exact statement that these people give uh because it's it's just sort of here we go. This is a, there need there is a needs to be a higher professional standard for police, especially when it comes to social media. So they're basically saying like, oh, we're we're gonna train our cops and we're gonna we're gonna put forth this this uh you know this policy that you have to be professional online and you have to uphold values of the community online when half these fucking people don't live in the communities that they police. So they don't really know how these communities work anyway. You know, they live out in the suburbs. They live out in a, a richer neighborhood with with their own police force, uh, with their own with people that don't live in those neighborhoods. Right. Um, so. That's that's all it is. It's just a statement that claims that they're going to have a policy to, of 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 more professionalism. Right. Which which begs the question, how do you. How do you uh, manage the balance of professionalism and racist vitriol? How does that work? You know, do, do you use do you use like more businessy terms when you're saying you don't care about black lives or or you deem protesters as terrorists? You know, is there is there a businessy language or or is it like you post a picture of yourself uh, in like a in like a nice blue shirt and tie and you wear like a, a a a nice blazer, and you and you have like a fraternal order of the police pin on, and uh, um, you know, uh, and then and then you just use the n word nonstop. Is that more professional? Would that be a more professional way of handling yourself on on Facebook? Well, you know, you he might have said the n word, but look at that tie! What a fucking great tie that is! That's a professional looking tie. They also claim like, oh, man, we didn't know that things were going to get out of hand. <laughs> it's like, really? Oh, man, really? Like when you start saying Black Lives Matter is terrorists or transphobic bullshit, you don't think comments are going to get out of hand? <laughs>
Have you not been paying attention to how politics works in America? Have you not been paying attention to how fucking Facebook works? <laughs> like, Facebook fucking loves. They love this shit. They love uh, they love conflict because conflict keeps you on their platform. So so they perpetuate more uh, negativity than they do like positive, critically thought out conversations. That's what Facebook does. Here's the problem. There's no accountability with these things, right? They use these things like, oh, we want them to con they want them to be more professional and conduct themselves in a more professional manner. Well, well, where's the accountability? Right. They're active duty police officers. Some of them are police chiefs. Right. There's one guy um, that made a, a comment about Mike Brown in 2014. And he basically said, oh, the fam the, the, the city settled with the family. And uh, and and they base the settlement on loss of income, right? Lots of future income. Well, what about Officer Darren Wilson? This guy's going to lose income too. Yeah, because he fucking murdered somebody, and he shouldn't be allowed to be. He shouldn't allowed be allowed to be a police officer anymore. Because you murdered an innocent child. And then he was like, what a fucking joke, right? And then the comments, of course, got crazy racist about, oh, this is the welfare state. Let's play the Jefferson's theme song uh, and a bunch of other racist, crazy shit that happens in comment sections. And the guy was like, oh, I had no idea this would happen. And he's running for an open magister magisterial judge seat <laughs> in his district. And this guy's the police chief. Like the police chief is making these sort of things. And it, and it would have been a thing if he said, look, I am, uh, because the statement he said was like, oh, I'm trying to support police officers. And if that was the case, when all those racist fucking comments came up, if you hit reply and said, hey man, I'm trying to look out for the family of Darren Wilson because he's a person too, right? At least that's tolerable. You can make an argument that way. It's It's not an accurate argument by any means, because this dude did murder somebody. And if if it was like you or me that murdered somebody, we they'd, they'd fucking throw the book, lock me up and throw the key away. But because this guy has a gun and a badge, he's allowed to do whatever the fuck he wants. Yeah, he's never he's not going to be able to earn a proper income, but so are people that get thrown in jail for minor drug offenses, nonviolent minor drug offenses. So it's a catch 22. But of course, because Facebook feeds negativity, none of those conversations can really be had. You can't look at this police officer and make these sort of arguments and make these sort of cases and point out the flaws in the criminal justice system and make them think because that's not how fucking Facebook works. And realistically, will they listen? I don't know, but it's worth a fucking shot. But that's my point. Having these conversations is the accountability for these police officers because I, I don't think they have blinders on and they're listening to corporate media and they don't fucking know that this is this, you know, what the true inequalities of the criminal justice system are. What are the true inequalities that they're trying to uphold within their criminal justice system and how racist they're actually being? They have no idea because they don't see anything past their echo chamber. When you make bland statements like this, what you do is is basically you're looking at these cops. And, and, and this is also like comes from like cancel culture pushing to be like, oh, cancel all this shit is you, you sit there and say you're wrong, but you don't explain why they're wrong right? Why you're not explaining why racial stereotypes are wrong, because clearly to those people, they don't see it. That's why they're making the statement. And they know that, oh, I have these edgy beliefs and, and people get offended because they can't handle the truth, man. That's how these fucking people think. They don't realize that their, their, their fucking words, their actions, the way they carry themselves, that behavior is wrong. And you have the opportunity to fix those behaviors and become a better person. They have no idea they can do that. There's no consequences attached to it. And they're not really learning any of that shit. So what do they do is th these sort of bland fucking responses and, and the cancel culture that surrounds it ends up being just you, the person are wrong, not you, your racist behavior is wrong. And you can come out of that racism and become a better person. No, it's you, the individual. And when you when you put the blame and you try to shame these people and by, by saying you, the individual are wrong, it's the same thing that happens when these racists uh, attack the other group where they say, oh, you are part of this ethnicity. So you, the individual are wrong. It creates the same shame cycle and it pushes people into echo chambers on both sides of the argument. 
You can't do that. It's it's psychologically been proven that when you shame the person rather than shame the behavior, you push them into these follow these these negative echo chambers. So now what they do is they go back into those Facebook groups and they go, can you believe this shit? And it starts to cycle all over again, except now it deepens the cycle and they and it becomes harder and harder for you for for society to pull these people out, teach them why they're why they are wrong in saying racist things, in in making jokes about the welfare state, in making jokes about trans people. And they just continue to bury themselves into this fucking narrative. Now, this is where things start to escalate, though, right? Because they're they're deep. Some of these people are deeply embedded within these groups and within these echo chambers that some of them started calling for violence. Which is where this sort of racism leads to is if you if you know, you can leave it on the surface level, you can leave it as kind of this academic racism of like, oh, well, if you think about the statistics and da-da-da, right, it, it'll eventually fucking lead to this violent form of racism. That's why it's it's important to address these people and have a conversation, and, and that conversation creates the accountability because it makes them look at the groups that they're discriminating against as actual fucking people. That's the accountability. And you can hit them right in the beginning of it, right? But but they but again, it's a twofold because these people need to want to have that conversation, right? It's not just up to us to initiate the conversation, but it's up to them to carry that conversation. And it's a long, hard process. I get it. It involves a lot of patience, uh, which patience that a lot of people don't have. But you know, as people kind of carry forward with that ideology, it leads to violence. So in this Facebook group, a lot of people were calling for violence. Uh, Antoine Rose, who was a, a young man that was shot in the back by a police officer, a police officer that is now trying to sue the city, um, he got killed. There were protests for it. There were demonstrations, right? So people laid on the street, blocked traffic. That's how civil disobedience works. That's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to disrupt to get your message across. That's the fucking point. One of these cops in Pittsburgh was stuck in traffic because of these demonstrations. And he posted in the group something about, you know, how these protesters are, are creating all these problems and havoc. And, you know, oh, man, uh, it's a shame that my service revolver is in my trunk. Something along those lines. And other people were like commending him for it. And other people were encouraging him to use his service revolver on the protesters and then saying that it was self-defense. And again, <laughs> that's like four years ago that this was happening. And Facebook didn't take this group down. So again, their whole thing of, oh man, we, we didn't know you were going to write an article. We were just doing the right thing is all bullshit. Because four years ago, there was active calls for violence in this Facebook group. And they fucking did nothing about it. Dr. Levine was another target. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with Dr. Levine, she is, um, let me find her actual title in the article. Um, I did not take a note of that, and that's my fault. I should have I should have written that down. I figured I would remember. She's the, she's the uh, secretary, Pennsylvania Health Secretary, Rachel Levine, secretary of, she's a Pennsylvania Health Secretary, and right now she has been tapped by Joe Biden to be the assistant health secretary. Right. Uh, so now she's going from a state level to a federal level. Big deal for her. Uh, she's a trans woman, um, you know, openly, openly a, a trans woman. And uh, these people started feeling transphobic. They levied transphobic um, attacks at her, referring to Dr. Levine as he or it or freak. That's what they were saying. And then they called for violence by claiming that someone needs to shoot her. Quote, it, the quote from the AP article is, someone needs to shoot this thing. A retired officer wrote this. So now they're calling for the death of the first trans woman to, to reach public office, as is my understanding, right? And, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a huge proponent of judging an individual by their identity. I think it, I think that's awesome that she's the first 
uh, trans person to to reach a, the a federal level position. That's cool. That's great. I, that's it's great representation. But you know, we should go beyond the representation. I hope that she has good policies and and we'll be able to advise the president to like you know listen to fucking science and not reopen the schools when every fucking scientist scientist is saying don't fucking do it because it causes community spread. And right now is not the time because we're trying to get vaccines into arms of people and the vaccine won't work if people have COVID nineteen. You're just going to exacerbate the problem. You know that kind of thing. Uh, so, <laughs> but the point being is, again, this was a year ago that they were doing this. She has been on the forefront of Pennsylvania's health initiatives since the beginning of this pandemic. That's, that's really when she started getting a lot of notoriety, um, and a lot of public attention, right? Because, uh, she would go and do these press conferences and basically tell people like, Hey, we're, we're doing this for this reason. Here's the science behind it. So on and so forth. Um, I don't really know what her background is. I've, I've never done an extensive research on Dr. Levine. Um, so I can't tell you exactly what her connections are or anything, but she seems to be a nice person. I'll put, I'll leave it at that. Cause that's all I know about her, but to levy these sort of attacks and there were transphobic attacks coming from every fucking where, because that's what happens. Um, because you know, when, when human beings don't understand something, they fucking, they attack it. That's how, you know, cause we're still animals. We're still, you know, deep down in our amygdala with these tiny little almond shaped portions of our brain that control a majority of our brain because we're all run by fear because that's how the political parties run. And that's how society is operating. When we see something we don't understand, we go right to the amygdala and base all of our reactions from there. Because we're animals, you know, that's the lizard brains. That's that's so that's where we're we're operating from. I wrote a bit about this that I want to kind of bring back uh, when 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 live performances come back, because because I think it's an important thing to note about human beings. And I think it's funny. You know, it's a fun it's it's. It's funny that we are this evolved species that still listens to the smallest portion of our brain and dictate all of our actions through there. I find that humorous in a dark way. Anyway, uh, but, you know, now, again, they're calling for violence. This was like a year ago that this happened. And Facebook still didn't shut this thing down. And now all of this is, is revealed, which, by the way, I'm all for the transparency of this, right? I don't want racists and homophobes and transphobes and all of these fucking discriminatory assholes to be in the shadows. I want them out in the open so we know who they are and we know where they are and who is worth the time to have the conversation with. You know, how deep are you in this fucking echo chamber of hate? I'm I'm totally fine with shining a light on these people. Now, again, like I said, this this group's intent was for you know, alleviating stress from a stressful job. And like I said, comics do this. I know nurses do this. Uh, I dated a, a nurse and whenever we would go out with her nurse friends, like, holy fuck, are they dark? <laughs> like nurses have real dark senses of humor. And actually Star Trek illustrated this. If, if you're a fan of Star Trek Deep Space Nine, which I highly recommend people check out. It's a very underrated Star Trek series um, and doesn't get the the love that it should. It's fucking phenomenal. Uh, Benjamin Sisko is a fantastic uh, captain for for the for the the circumstances that they were facing. He is the right captain for it. Like Picard would not be, uh, or Janeway would not be the right character uh, for what they were going through. But there's a whole big war that happens, and there there's a triage center in one of the war zones that uh, uh, Doctor Bashir, one of the characters, uh, gets involved in, and Captain Sisko's son, Jake Sisko. Uh, is is trying to be a journalist, so he's doing uh, on the ground reporting, and and he overhears in the cafeteria these three doctors, these three nurses, right? Um, I can't remember if they were doctors or nurses, but it doesn't matter because they're medical professionals and they should be treated equally because nurses do uh, as good of a job, if not better, than a lot of doctors. Uh, but they're, these medical professionals are sitting down having conversation, right? It's like three three of them and Bashir, and they're all talking about like what would be their preferential uh, way to die. That that's the conversation, and it's this super dark conversation. And if you don't have a dark sense of humor, 
it's very easy to listen to that conversation and be like, this is fucked up. But the exponent and, and Jake Sisko calls that out. And Bashir has to take them aside and say, look, these people deal with death all the time. Like that's what they're fight. That's what they're fighting. They are in a constant battle with death, and they need they need an outlet. They need a way to cope and get through it, so that if they lose a patient, it doesn't completely crumble them, and their and their ethics and their morality and all that stuff. They need something of that because he like lo- he like started yelling at them, right? So. It's one of those things where it's like, I understand the need to vent. But here's the thing. All that shit has a limit. You you kind of draw your lines, right? When it comes to racism and homophobia and transphobia and any form of discrimination, that's the fucking line that you draw. So there were cops in there. There were there were cops of color in, in the group that tried to address some of the, the, the discrimination that these people brought up. And they brought up issues with the system itself. And they were either kicked out of the group or laughed out of the group or they were made fun of or or they were or racist comments were levied against them. And that's the line. Right. It, and and this because these people who were bringing a oppositional viewpoint where it's like, hey, guys, maybe we should defund the police. Maybe we should think about how uh, we are perpetuating uh, a racist criminal justice system. Right. Like th- when those conversations are had within that group, those people are kicked out. So now it becomes an even bigger echo chamber. The issue in this circumstance, because the, the conversation always comes up, oh, if you post something racist or say something racist, like, should you be removed from your job? You know, in a lot of instances, if it's going to affect your job, and when it comes to policing, it does affect your job. Because if you're looking at things through a discriminatory lens, you're not you're not objectively trying to protect and serve the community. The separate issue is that's not where policing comes from anyway. They're trying to protect and serve rich people uh, and the interests of the rich. So they're trying to really protect and serve rich people's shit. Um, not really the community at large. But it's going to hinder your job. You are you are now going to make criminal justice decisions through a transphobic, racist, homophobic, discriminatory lens. And that's not accurate. That's not accurate law enforcement. Here's the here's a little bit of hypocrisy with this, right? Is one of the things that they say in the groups, like you, I don't know if you're if you guys are big Facebook people, but Facebook groups have like rules that they set. Um, you know, some places are like, don't share ticket links or don't spam people or don't try to anything that has a money dollar sign attached to it. We're not allowed. You can only have this kind. Of, you know, so there's rules. Um, in this, what you say in here stays in here, which I thought was very funny because. Isn't the point of your beliefs is to, to let everybody know so that everybody can join in on this? Isn't that the point? Like, why why are you trying to hide it? Are you trying to hide it? Because deep down inside, you know what you're saying is fucked up. You know what you're saying is wrong. You know what you're saying is is rooted in hate and ignorance. And that there is probably a narrative out there that counters and proves you wrong. Therefore, having to rethink your whole way of living. You know all that shit is true. Is that why you want to hide it? Is that why you want to stay in your shadows? Is that why you want to protect your little little uh, members-only club? Seems that way. It's, it's interesting, right? These racists are so proud of their heritage. They're proud of where they come from. They're proud to be, uh, b- 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 you know, white, Anglo-Saxon, whatever. But when it comes to making that pride public on a, on a platform that will immortalize your viewpoints, no, 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 let's not do that. Keep this shit between us. Why? Because you know it's wrong. 
that's the reality of it. You know the behavior you're 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 taking part in is wrong. But they continue to be in that echo chamber because the way that we kind of handle these sort of situations is by saying you the individual is wrong when really it's the behavior that's wrong. And again, all of this shit isn't going to work on everybody. But if enough people articulate and and I get it. It's exhausting to have the conversation over and over again about like, this is why transphobia is wrong. This is why homophobia is wrong. This is why racism is wrong. But clearly not enough people have, have had that impact. And clearly because of the state of corporate media, uh, pop culture, because you, you know, because low hanging fruit, racist stereotype jokes are still seen on national television day in, and day out, people think it's okay. Liberals fucking make racist jokes to me all the time. It it has permeated our society and our culture to the point where now average people have to fucking push back against those narratives. And we have to be louder than a fucking Chuck Lorre show that says brown people can't talk to girls. Fuck you, Chuck Lorre. I'll talk to many girls. And yeah, most of them will be like, why are you talking to me about Noam Chomsky at a bar? And I'll be like, okay, I'll leave my copy of Manufacturing Consent at home next time. That's cool. That's cool. Enjoy your drink. And then I fuck off because I'm not a fucking monster that's going to try to force somebody into a conversation they don't want to have. But that's what we need to do on the ground level. When we see shit like this, we have to call it out and we have to we have to put a mirror to these people so that they can see what they're doing, how it affects people and why their behavior is wrong. And that's the accountability. Bland fucking statements from police uh, police departments ain't going to solve any of that shit. Uh, let's look at a few comments. Uh, dear with Franklin, just just uh, uh, over on PayPal, buying Christian coffee or tea, whatever he needs at the moment. Thank you very much. That is very, very kind of you. I really appreciate that dinner with Franklin. Uh, awful kind of you there. Uh, also says, uh, since a problem won't be addressed until it's it is recognized as a problem. Is there anything that could show them that it is a problem? That's a good question. I have this conversation with a lot of people a lot. And, and you know, it. In these sort of instances, there have to be direct consequences to this shit. So, you know, their Facebook group got sh shut down. Okay, well, they'll just make a new one, right? Uh, bland statements like, oh, we want to hold people to a more professional standard. No, no, no. If they, if they make these sort of statements, it's clear that they are unable to do their job. And it's not sensitivity training that's going to change it. It's, it's, it's got to be something else. They have to lose their job or or be put on suspension without pay, right? Fucking, uh, what's his what's his name? Chauvin, Derek Chauvin, got paid leave for two weeks after he murdered people. That's not showing accountability. Take their pay away, hit them financially, right? Uh, that's gonna make an impact. I'm not for economic sanctions or anything like that, but they do make an impact. Why not use them for positive means then? I don't know if that's the absolute solution, but there needs to be a conversation. What what another thing that could happen is that the community can come together and say, look, we need to have a sit down with our police officers. And you need to listen to how we have a problem with the shit that you guys say online. That's a conversation that you can have. Now that the community that you're so-called serving has a problem with you there because you're racist and transphobic and homophobic, you're like, I can't trust you because I don't think you have good judgment. That's that's gonna that might make a difference. To I mean, for for cops and a lot of these people, it's about respect. And if you basically show them that based on their opinions and their beliefs and their viewpoints and their behavior based on those beliefs and viewpoints, that the community no longer respects them, that's, that's going to start making an impact. The difference is once that 
once you have those conversations, are they going back to those echo chambers and bitching about it? Or are they actually taking the time to reflect? That's the second part of it. That's the hardest part. I don't, and I don't know how you make somebody uh, <laughs> be introspective. I, I don't know if I have a solution for that. Um, psychological assessments. Yeah, psychological assessments have been talked about a lot, right? Uh, is is to encourage psychological assessments for cops themselves so that when they, you know, when they commit these things, you take them off the force, you take them off the streets, and you send them to psychological evaluation to talk about what happened and why it happened. But most cops don't want to do that because, ooh, touchy-feely things are, are, are dumb, and we won't have to do any of that shit. Um, What's the uh, the Philadelphia Fraternal Order of Police actually said that they their psychological uh, assessments are a shot and a beer. So good. So alcoholic cops. That's fun. That's I'm sure alcoholic cops are not going to have any issues with with uh, with with judgment at all. Uh, <laughs> all he says, oh, yes, yeah, sorry to bother you, but people are being murdered, <laughs> Yeah, which is a very polite way to say it. I, w I would love it if one of the protesters were like, we're sorry about the traffic jam, but people are getting murdered illegally. <laughs> so I hope this inconvenience makes you realize because if people continue to get murdered, we'll mildly inconvenience you some more. <laughs> Which if that's the, if that's like the biggest issue you have is that you're waiting in traffic for a little while while people are protesting on the streets, consider yourself incredibly fucking privileged that, that you don't have to worry about being killed on the street, that somebody's going to throw shit or yell racial epithets at you <laughs> like. Uh, Denver Franklin says a refusal to make an effort to understand the ununderstood, not not inability, but flat out refusal. Uh, at least the phobes I know. Yeah, this is the, this is the ultimate challenge of it is is that I don't know how to break that wall. I, I don't I, I've, I've done it a couple times. You know, like my ex father in law used to say random racist shit to me all the time in, in an effort to. I don't know, have a conversation and I would listen to his stories and then I would just be like, OK, so that was a experience you had with a black person that was negative. That one experience doesn't mean that all black people are, are that way. You had an individual experience. Do you know how many fucking white people have been super shitty to me? And I don't think all white people are shitty. That would be crazy and discriminatory and racist <laughs> like. So breaking that, you're absolutely right, is the refusal is the bigger part of that challenge. Um, and look, if they refuse, you go, OK, well, then the consequence of this is that you are now making you the individual wrong because you have now accepted that the behavior is who you are. And maybe that's going to get get them to see, oh, shit, I fucked up. Maybe. I don't know. I, th this is the problem with it is I don't have a concrete solution. I have some ideas. Uh, but again, the, the problem is it needs to be taken by everybody, not just one person. Uh, big DS9 fan and Star Trek references make me tingle. Uh, I love bringing in sci-fi. Like I feel like sci-fi is um, has so many great ways to handle sociopolitical topics. Uh, it, it, yeah, I, so I, 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 I will probably very much reference a lot of sci-fi shit. <laughs> uh, Dermot Franklin also says almost any racist post on social media will get people fired, but active racism and threats of violence don't for cops. This seems more consistent with the role as enforcers than public protection. Yeah. Uh, I have noticed that too. I've noticed more average people get fired for making any sort of racist comment, mild or otherwise. But with cops, there is this there's this protection that happens. Um, and, you know, this goes this goes to show you why there are no, quote, good cops is because they get booted out of the system, just like they got booted out of this group for 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 calling attention to being like, hey, maybe we should side with the protesters. Maybe we should you know, it's, start rethinking the way law enforcement is, um, is, is, is done in our country. Right. Um, 
And Holly points out, you know, ex-military police bring their racist experience with them, too. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, ex-military people where this is the only job that they can get because it's all that they know, because they don't get health services. They don't get counseling. They don't know how to deal with their trauma properly. So they take their tra they they take all that baggage and then they become police officers because it allows them to continue, you know, being the best of the best and, and that sort of stuff. So, um Again, these people don't lose their jobs. They're encouraged to be racist because the criminal justice system is encouraged to be racist, right? That's, that's what the war on drugs showed us uh, with, with the disparity of, uh, of how they treated crack cocaine versus actual cocaine, the way they treated black people with marijuana offenses. So, you know, the, the system is racist. Getting people to realize that the system is racist is, I don't know. Thank you so much for checking out this video. If you enjoyed this content, uh, please make sure that you hit the like button, hit the share button, and make sure you're subscribed to my channel, whether it's on Rockfin, YouTube, or Facebook. Especially Facebook and YouTube, they often uncensor pe uh, un unsubscribe people and they censor this content. So if you want to keep up to date, make sure you're subscribed. Hit that bell button so you get notifications of when I'm putting up new videos and when I am going live. I usually go live uh, on uh, Fridays and on Mondays. Uh, and if you want more information about a, a bunch of the other stuff that I do... Uh, whether it's my Forkful of Noodles podcast, the Taboo Table Talk interview podcast, or the Road Reflections live streams, uh, make sure you go to my website, krishmohanhaha.com. It's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com. There you'll find past episodes of, uh, of various shows that I, uh, that I do, as well as information about when I'll be performing live virtual comedy shows the forkful of noodles live virtual comedy shows uh the dates and tickets will be available directly on my website but if you're also on financial stable ground you can help contribute to the show financially by making a one-time donation or becoming a sustaining member which gets you free tickets and bonus content and go to krishmohanhaha.com slash donate to to make any kind of financial contributions but if you can't it's not a necessity most of my stuff is available for free and for everybody to enjoy. So again, go to krishmohanhaha.com. It's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A. -H 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 -A, and I hope to see you at the next video.